<laughs> One reason I've always pastored a generational church is because we can learn so much from each other. Amen. Ms. Shirley sits there. I didn't know her for the first year or so we, we, we met, but she was home for COVID. But she sits there year uh, Sunday after Sunday, and she even comes on Wednesday night, so she's really glad for punishment. <laughs> and um, and she listens to a 51-year-old, you know, old enough to be her grandson, every Sunday. And we can listen to our elders as well, and we can learn a lot from a dummy, not Miss Shirley or the preacher, but... You know, the, the, the phrase says we can learn a lot from a child, we can learn a lot from a 96-year-old wise person. So uh, that's why I pastor a church that's generational. Uh, that, that's not just a bunch of yuppies, uh, not just a bunch of young people, uh, Xers or Zs or Ys or whatever the generation, boomers, busters, X, you know, you know we, we pastor a church that has all generations because we can learn. So thank you, Ms. Shirley, for, for that. And uh, it takes a lot of uh, boldness to stand up and say, hey, can I share something? That's, that's hard. That's tough. So thank you, Ms. Shirley, uh, for that. And I'm going to be at your house tonight for trick or treat, okay? So <laughs> somebody else can play the movie. Because I, I want some treats. <laughs> treats. We are talking about beginnings. Ms. Shirley, you remember when you were born, right? <laughs> Many years ago, beginnings, when we, when this all began, this, this earth, this universe. Next week, we're going to actually look at when we were created, man and woman. And um, today, we're going to look at uh, Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 20. But before we get there, I want to I set this up by talking about what our culture talks about all the time. The famous evolutionist and astro astronomer, Carl Sagan, who did not believe in God, but believed that the universe itself was almighty and the universe was eternal, was asked on one of his last interviews before his death in 1996, quote, do you have any last words of wisdom for the people of the world? Now this is one of the greatest scientific astronomers out there, right, in the 70s and 80s. Sagan said, what's up on your screen? We live on a hunk of a rock of metal, rock and metal, and that circles a star that is one of 400 billion other stars that make up the Milky Way galaxy, which is one of billions of other galaxies, which make up a universe which, which may be one of very large number, perhaps an infinite number of other universes. That is a perspective on human life and our culture that is well worth pondering. Oh, well, thank you, Carl. <laughs> I mean, are you kidding me? In the end, the most brilliant, one of the most brilliant modern-day evolutionists only knows that the universe exists. He doesn't know how it exists. He doesn't know why it exists. And more importantly, he don't know who created the universe. Matter of fact, if you read anything about Satan, he actually believes that aliens planted this on, the, on this planet. Sagan believed that, there, that, that we are nothing special, we are just part of a vast, mostly unknown universe that has always existed. There was no in the beginning. It was just always there. What a sad legacy to leave the world. As we have seen so far in our study of Genesis, that everything in the universe points to God, the Creator. Even Albert Einstein, who was not a Christian believer, of course he was a Jew, he said, of course there is a massive intelligence behind the universe. Any man is a fool who doesn't believe that. Charles Darwin said this, if it could be demonstrated that in any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive Slight modifications, which is called evolution, my theory would be absolutely my theory would absolutely break down. Well, I, I'm kind of glad you said that because it does break down. That's right. And a guy by the name of Michael Behe of Lehigh, Lehigh University demonstrated that through his uh, molecule machines, which he calls irreducible complexity. Listen to this. He uses a mousetrap as an analogy. 
Basically, a mousetrap has five components, as you see on your screen. The base, metal hammer, a spring, a catch, and a metal bar. All of these components must be present and in the right relationship to each other for the trap to work. If one of them is absent, then the trap doesn't catch half as many mice. The trap catches no mice. If one of these things are missing. Now evolution can't produce a mechanic, a mechanism like a mousetrap all at once. The odds are too great. And you can't produce it directly by numerous successful slight modifications because the precursor system would be missing a part and therefore it couldn't function. So you would have the, 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 the mouse running around, as we said before, with the half a wing, turning into a bat, right? And it don't work. He'd be eaten. He'd be food. It doesn't work. He can't evolve. Or the, the, the fish, we came out of the ocean. We'll look at the ocean today. And we came out of the ocean, right? And, 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 and so uh, we came out of the ocean. And so the, the, the fish has gills and has to develop a lung. Well, I mean, he would die. Get the other fish food. It doesn't work. It, it, it's not it, you know, like the mouse trap. If you don't have all of the components all at once, it doesn't fit. There would be no reason for it to exist. Natural selection only chooses systems that are already working. When we look at a mouse trap, we see obvious signs of an intelligent designer behind it all. We have seen in Genesis that there is a designer. There, that, excuse me. There is a design within the universe, and that uh, there is a design. Thus, there must be a designer. When we observe the complexity and the diversity of the universe and the world in which we live, we are left with no other possible explanation than some divine intelligence and power of proportions beyond comprehension created everything we see. Now, as Christians, we have to pounce on that. We have to say, look around you. Look at the beauty, the design. I mean, if you if you go to the medical field, like my daughter is, or or or, or Miss Mary was in the medical field, or or, or or what is it? Just the nurses on the second row over here, Miss Marshall on the in the medical field. If you go to the medical field and you start studying the human body, you become in awe of the design of the human body, which we'll see next week. If you go into the, uh, the field of astronomy or, or, or science, you begin to look at the complexities of, of how things are. You, you should come to the conclusion of, of, of this great, there is a designer out there. So, so far in Genesis, we have seen that God has created the universe out of nothing. The earth, the skies above, the land, the seas, the vegetation, the lights in the sky, including the sun and the moon, which is what we and the stars, which is what we saw last week. Today we will see God continues to fill this planet with wonderful things for us to enjoy, leading up to his greatest masterpiece, and that is us, which we'll see next week. So now that you're comfortable, let's read Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 20. Why don't we stand and do that? Genesis chapter, if you can stand. Genesis chapter 1. We say, why don't we stand? Well, we want to honor God's word and stand. Uh, it's just kind of a tradition that I like to do. And so it says, Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 20. I'm reading on a Holy Christian standard of the version, the version of the Bible. And the Bible says this. Then God said, let the water swarm with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the Lord's sea creatures and every living creature that moves and swarms in the water according to their kind. It's very important. According to its own kind. According to its own kind. He also created every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was okay. It was good. It wasn't just okay. It was good. Good. So God blessed them. Be fruitful. Multiply. Fill the waters of the seas. And let the birds multiply on earth. And so evening came and did morning the fifth day. Now I want to go a little bit into the sixth day because I want to reserve the sixth day specifically for the creation of, of mankind. Verse 24, then God said, let the earth produce living creatures according to their kind. Livestock, creatures that crawl, and, and the wildlife of the earth according to its kind, 
and it was so. And so God made the long life of the earth according to their kind, livestock according to their kind, creatures that crawl on the ground according to their kind, and God saw that it was good. You may be seated. I think according to its own kind is pretty important, don't you think? I think God knew that Charles Darwin would come and, per, and, and try to perfect this theory of evolution and that, that kinds jump species. Kinds go from, you know, from fish uh, uh, to, to, you know, from mammal uh, to, to, to reptile, from reptile to bird, from bird to, you know, however that works, right? I don't know, I'm not a scientist. But, and, and so I think God knew that and he put it in there and he had Moses write according to its own kind. You can't jump kind. It's never been proven. You can't do it. So first of all, God says this. He says, God said, let there be sea life. Boom. Henry Morris, an expert on Genesis, says that the first introduction of life was not a fragile blob of protoplasm, protoplasm that happened to come together by chance in response to electrical discharges over a primitive swamp. Rather, God said for the waters to be swarming with creatures of various kinds. Conscious life began on day five of creation. You see, plants, despite what some people think, and hopefully you don't think that way, but plants do not move on their own, nor do they have a consciousness. But only living things have a consciousness. Animals are not self-conscious, but they do respond to their environment as beings. They are not aware of that response. It is purely instinct that drives an animal. It separates us from plants and animals and us. I'm not an animal, by the way. You may consider yourself an animal. I'm not, an, I'm not some mammal. I'm created in the image of God. I'm God's special creation. One day the Bible says I'll, I'll be higher than the angels. And so will you if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not some mere animal. See, that's the problem. We, we've we've uh, programmed our children. We've programmed our world to believe we're just an animal. I can't help it. That's just how I was raised. That's just how I was born. Well, that's just who I am. Well, if you're a jerk, why don't you change it? Nobody likes a jerk. Well, I can't. Well, yes, you can. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you can change. And I'm evidence of that, and a lot of you are evidence of that as well. I don't want to live my life on instinct. Trust your gut. Trust your heart. The Bible says the heart is, is, is imperative, is, uh, is, uh, is wicked in all things. Who knows that only God knows the heart? We've got to be careful. I mean, my, my instinct is, with, is if you attack me, one of my instincts is to attack you back. That's not good. If you attack me, one of my instincts is flight, right? Fight or flight. I'm going to run away. I mean, those are not good. We, we need to work on those things. We, we need to reach deep down into the, into the, uh, the, the pit of our soul and, and find where God is wanting us to, to deal with people, to deal with life. Not through our instincts, but, but through our divine nature that he's created in us, that we're the temple of God because the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin and the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of us. And so when somebody does those things to us, we can respond in a positive way, not instinctively, but supernaturally. Well, I'm just, I, I don't want you to act natural. I want you to act supernatural. Amen. You don't want your preacher to act natural. I mean, I used to box. I'm a pure Sherry. That is how some of you may walk out after this. That's okay. I'm, you know, I'll preach to myself, I think. But anyway, I'm a pure Sherry. My mom was a Sherry and my dad was a Sherry. That's my last name, right? Uh, Y'all can scratch your head and try to figure that out. So Reggie's there going, what does that mean, right? My mom and dad have the same last name. They're cousins. Okay, I mean, that's pretty bad. I'm from Louisiana, what you expect? But anyway. It's true. Sure beats Arkansas. But anyway, anyway. Right. I used to tell my wife, my wife I used to say, baby, you're a big old redneck. She'd go, I'm not a redneck. My, at least my family tree forks. It's true. Would you stop saying it's true? It's true. Why don't you say that on the good points of the sermon? Not when I'm trying to get myself. Ah, uh, yeah, and I just forgot what I was going to say about all that. I'm sure it was pretty good. But... Uh, oh, instinctively. So a share me, down in South Louisiana, we, we feel the whole phone book. 
You know, like three or four pages in the, when, when there was a phone book. Miss Shirley, you know what a phone book was, right? I, I, anybody still own a phone book? I mean, it's... Oh boy, I asked the wrong crowd. I tell you <laughs> Shannon, you don't own a phone book, right? No, I get the phone book in the mail here at the church. I'm like, <laughs> Brenda's like, now this never happened, but I can see Brenda like, why is the phone book in the trash, preacher? I'll just have to put it on the shelf. I'm like, nobody needs a phone book anymore. But some of you do. But anyway, we had the most names where I'm from in the phone book. We were Sherry's. And a, a Sherry was, well, they always had a knife on them, according to, you know, uh, legend, right? And we were always mad. The Sherry's family, I mean, you didn't ask for the Sherry. And I'm a pure Sherry. Mama's a Sherry. And my dad is a Sherry. I mean, it's like, oh man, don't mess with that guy. He's just a junkyard on me. Ooh, ooh, me. Well, instinctively, that's who I was. But that's not who I am today. Amen. Uh, God has changed me. He's, he, he's, he's done some great things in me. I'm not living on instinct. I, I'm living through the power of the Holy Spirit Amen. most of the time. I'm trying. So God did not need evolution to create life. He simply speaks created life out of nothing and instantaneously the Bible says massive swarms of sweet sea creatures are breathing and moving throughout ponds and streams and rivers and bays and lakes and seas and oceans. Why is it? You see that turtle there? I took that picture uh, you know when I was I would never take that picture. <laughs> if I saw something like that I'd probably never get in the water. Oh it's just a turtle. That thing's big. It might eat me. Why is, I mean, people go nuts about the turtles. I lived in Hawaii and the turtles would come, these big turtles, you know, 400 pound turtles would come and they would beach themselves on the beach. Oh, I, I mean, it was, you had a, it was like a, listen, I mean, you could probably, you could kill somebody and not get as much time in jail if you killed one of those turtles. I mean, it's a big, oh, it's a turtle, oh, oh, it's a big turtle. I mean, people would come visit our church. We live right off the beach there. People would come visit our church. Oh, do y'all know where the turtles are migrating? And we'd like to see the turtles. I'm like, it's just a turtle, man. You know, that's fine. It's a turtle. But I mean, I look at I like to look at people better than turtles. Amen. I can't wait till Kelly walks in. If she was gonna hear it today, I was gonna do this. I can't wait to. Well, she may not walk in. She may wheel in, but you know, I mean, she may hobble in. But when Miss Kelly walks in, I want us all to stand up. Woo! Kelly's here. Yes, Kelly's here. Henry comes in and goes, Woo! Henry's here. I mean, people, we we have more value. We have we we're created in the image of God. Everybody gonna freak out over the turtle, over the turtle. Oh man, the whales were huge. Woo! Even my wife did some of that sometimes, you know? She's like, oh, I saw a whale! I'm like, okay, great, you saw a whale, that's fine. That's cool. <laughs> cool, big deal. I love people. No, 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 you don't like me. But anyway, water is preeminently the seed of life. There is not in bay or a creek on the face of the earth that's not swarm with some sort of life. Even a drop in a ditch water can hold 500 million microscopic creatures. Only an infant in God can do such great things by his word with all, with such small creatures. So that's how many microscopic creatures. Well, then you get the old uh, Jonah chapter 1 verse 17. Not only a microscopic creature, um, but Jonah, the Bible says, the Lord appointed a great fish. And what is a great fish? The biggest fish in the world is a sperm whale, right? Maybe it was a, a whale. We don't know. But a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights, and then he stunk. <laughs> He doesn't say that, but he's stuck, all right? I mean, God can use the microscopic things in the pond or a dish. Now listen, you say, well, how, who would eat those things? <clears throat> Y'all eat crawfish? No. no. Who eat, who, be brave. Who eats crawdads? No. no. Those are the most disgusting creatures. On the, they live in a ditch. In the mud. In the mud. Oh, don't suck them hands. Oh, that's gross. All right? I mean, if God could, 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 could do that with a crawfish and microscopic things, but then he could take the biggest fish in the ocean and, and get it to swallow his man, Jonah. God is an awesome God. He can do anything. Sea life, great sea creatures, small things, microscopic animals. By the way, all sea animals were made by God for man's use and delight. So when you see the turtle, you can get excited. Yeah. Because God created it. That's right. He 
go to SeaWorld, you and you get all wet, you think, oh, that was so cool. It's great. God created that for us. For our delight. The second thing, skylight. Notice God did not say maybe some fish will evolve into reptiles and then some reptiles will grow wings and fly above the air. Most birds weren't, uh, wouldn't have survived the first generation if they had not been created fully developed from the beginning, like I told you. You know, you have that one winged bird. He ain't flying anywhere. And if he ain't flying anywhere, he gonna get eaten. So yes, there would be no birds. You can't evolve that way. The hummingbird to the turkey to the cardinal to the mallet, birds were created by God. They were created to fly free under the heavens to rule the air. Throughout the Bible, birds were used by God. God says to the prophet Elijah during the great famine to go and hide in, in the east of the Jordan River where, he says, 1 Kings 17, 3 and 4, you will drink from the brook and have directed, I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. He uses a bird. He uses a whale or a big fish. He uses a, a bird. There are thousands of species of birds that God created for our benefit. Now, I know some of you, my parents are retired and, and they're in their 70s and they have bird houses. I mean, the only thing my mama could think of was when the hurricane came and we went to see the house. She's like, oh, my bird house is still there. I'm like, mom, it's 150 miles an hour wind. Your bird houses are in the bayou. I mean, they're gone. I mean, did you check out my bird house? I'm like, ah! But the bird house was vacant. They're on the ground. She's like, oh, birds. My bird house. I mean, how many of you have this problem? You have some bird houses. And you have the problem with squirrels. Anybody of y'all have them? Squirrels eat your bird food. That's from what I understand. They eat your bird food. I mean, there's all kind of creative ways to get stop the squirrels from eating your bird food. But I mean, birds are beautiful. And you, I mean, we're sitting there. And I mean, if a hummingbird, I mean, I was at my mom and dad's house and a hummingbird flew like right over my head. I mean, I wanted to get the shotgun. <laughs> I mean, a, 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 a hummingbird, man, it beats that long. Maybe that long. I mean, that thing hits you in the ear and the eye and you'll lose an eye. Oh my God. Uh, you don't need a BB gun to do that. You need a hummingbird. But that thing goes, and my mom's like, oh, hummingbird. I'm like, the hummingbird's about to die. I don't want a little creature flying all over my head. But anyway, so you got the skyline. You got this birds, this beautiful stuff. The cardinal, the birds. The, uh, a lot of you have bird houses. So when I go to your house, you can show me your bird house, all right? Not your. Samaritan's first box, the bird house, all right? <laughs> Miss Brenda, Miss Brenda had a bird hatch or uh, hatch, right? Miss Brenda had a bird hatch the other, at her house the other day and she showed a picture. I said, Brenda, that bird looks dead. I mean, that thing is ugly. Oh my goodness, that is the ugliest thing I've ever seen. I mean, and she's like, oh, it's gonna grow and it's gonna be better. And so we have birds. God created birds for us, thousands of species of birds. God created sea life and sky life after its own kind. There is no evolution of species from kind to kind to kind to kind. God created them after their own kind. There can be variation within their kind, but they're now moving outside their DNA, which is the information encoded by God in each species that lives in the sea and the sky. By the way, there couldn't be any progress or any mutation, any natural selection of species because God saw that it was all good. He saw that the birds were good. The birds didn't need to come evolve into something else. The birds were good. The fish were good. It was good. There was no death in the universe at this time. So if there's no death, by the way, what brought death? Sin. Sin. When did sin happen? Adam and Eve. What chapter in the Bible? Chapter 3. What book? Genesis. So we're still in Genesis chapter 1, and there is still no sin. Everything was good. Perfect. And then when he created me and you, he said, that's very good. I'm going to see Adam. Adam, Adam was alone. And God said, you know, you shouldn't be alone. All the other birds and stuff, they, they you know, the animals, they have some, uh, and I'm going to make, uh, I'm going to make Adam a, a, a suitable helpmate, a, a, an equal partner. Mom said, we're going to look at all that in a few weeks, in a few months. And, and, and then God said, and then he says, and then, and then uh, Eve shows up on the screen, you know, on the screen and, and uh, up, up on the, uh, whatever, on the scene, sorry. And, and, and Adam says, whoa, man, woman, woman. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to go back to reading my sermon. Be bored, yeah. 
Y'all not doing any good. You know? No, no dad. No dad. How can everything evolve? You had to have dad. There is no dad. The Bible says until chapter three. But finally, we're gonna look, go into uh, the next day, which is day six, and look at soil life. Soil life. First thing we see is domesticated animals. The first kind of animals that existed on the land is domesticated animals like horses and donkeys and sheep and cows. All these animals were created with man in mind. Up until a few hundred years ago, every culture for thousands of years before were based upon you can grow it, you can raise it to survive. An agronomy type culture, right? Remember that? Everybody was living in this type of culture until the uh, Industrial Revolution and the factories and all the things that we have today. I remember for Y2K, which is only, what, 21 years ago, I mean, people were like, we're not going to have any food, we're not going to be delivered. <laughs> and, and, and my generation like, okay, uh, well, uh, we're not going to have any food. Well, what, I mean, people are like, well, where did food come from? Well, it come from the H-E-B. Yeah. <laughs> you mean we got a grow? How many of you have a garden? Y'all have a garden? All right, you have a garden. Y'all, 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 uh, y'all have some cucumbers in that garden. Oh, man. Y'all did. Yeah. All right, I'd like some cucumbers from your garden. I love cucumbers. <laughs> My secretary, her name is Brenda, by the way. Uh, Brenda, Brenda, I think the deer ate her cucumbers or something because she's like, "Oh, let me get some cucumbers this year, preacher. I got a bunch of tomatoes." But so I mean, you, you, you grew a garden. And everybody had a garden. You see, you know what? I went to Russia. I went to Russia in 2009. And do you know that they still, uh, they would better. If our, if our culture lost its, all its technology, places like Russia, some of the, the, the second and third world parts of the world, would do better than us. Because in Russia, even in the city, the, the city sets out a, a plot of land over here in the country, and everybody has a little space to grow their own crops. It's interesting. So you see, you're driving down the road, and you're going into the city, or you're coming out of the city, and you look, and there's a, you know... There, there's a farm, and it's, it's for, for, for anybody who, you know, I don't know if they pay for it or whatever, but, you know, it's a little section where all the people live in the apartments and all these places, they come and they grow their own food. That's the culture we used to live in for thousands of years. It would have been impossible to maintain a farm without the domesticated style of animal. Before tractors and combines, there were horses and oxen, which were used to harvest crops. In the Old Testament, livestock was also used for sacrificing. So now why is that? Well, God wanted to teach humanity that sin is serious offense against him, and he used livestock as a sacrifice or a substitute for sin. You see, that sheep, you know, the problem with the Jews, what was happening in Israel in the Old Testament, they would bring their, their, their worst sheep for sacrifice. The God says, I want your first, I want your best. Why? Because I want it for you to understand the consequences of sin. Sin is serious. And if you take your best animal and you bring it uh, to uh, uh, the, the, the temple and we sacrifice it, uh, uh, you will remember how serious sin is. And so eventually I'm going to send my, my best Jesus Christ. I'm going to send my best and he's going to have to die on a cross for you to pay the penalty for your sin. You see, God used the domesticated animals because the domesticated animals was one of the most important animals to a, a, a society that grew their stuff <clears throat> and ate their stuff and, and had to live in an agronomy, agronomist type culture. It's a different picture now, right? Well, that's why. Well, the Bible says in, in uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12, it says, when he is, Jesus, his own blood, uh, not the blood of goats and calves, but he, Jesus, entered the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever. He was our sacrifice. That's how serious sin is. Now, when we freely accept and receive Christ's sacrifice for my sin and for your sin, he comes and he lives within us and he gives us the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, when you believe in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. Domesticated animals, very important in an agronomist type culture in the Old Testament up until just a few hundred years ago. Then God created, which I don't know why he did this, but we'll have to talk to him about this, but he created creepy crawlers. Yes. Now I pick on Brother David a lot. Brother David is fair game. He was a former pastor. And... <laughs> Furthermore, he does also have an opportunity in the future when he preaches for me while I'm out 
uh, to get back at me, okay? So they're, they're kind of fair game, he can get back at me. But yesterday, uh, Saturday, was it Saturday? It was Friday. Friday, David and I come, David comes out and helps out with the, with the grass and he weed eats. I never, I don't let him get on the tractor yet. I don't let him, you know, I'm like, yeah, that's mine. You know, and I love toy, right? The, the thing that Brother Leon and Miss Wilma donated to us, the, the little zero turn. But uh, anyway, maybe you can go borrow Jimmy Nails, you know, borrow Jimmy Nails and we can have a race and see who can cut faster. But anyway, so, so David was coming, was, we have a bunch of trees in our property and have some down trees and some things and David was coming to uh, cut some wood and stuff like that. And have, we had this huge pile of trees and debris and that we just put, we put into there and we need to burn it eventually. It's a burn pile, we need to burn it. And so there's some wood in there that you can harvest and put in your fireplace and all that. But David and I, oh, we're pretty smart guys, okay? We ain't going in there. Now Henry used to rattle, used to wrestle rattlesnakes. I don't know if you knew this, but Henry was a, a an adrenaline. Brother Henry was an adrenaline junkie. He really was as a young man. He would literally, you know, he'd catch snakes by the dozens. But you'd have to ask him about this rattlesnakes. Well, I, I don't know about you, but David and I looked at this big pile. We said, "Well, I'd like some wood, but I ain't going in that pile." Ain't no way, because a bunch of creepy koalas are gonna come out and might actually. <laughs> yeah. All right. So then there's a tree over there in the end. So David harvested what he could while I cut the grass, and I came back, and I was I had a <clears throat> I had a big chainsaw. David had one of the wimpy ones, right? And, and so I was gonna, uh, and I said I saw that David left some wood. Now he left some wood because his chainsaw wore out. And he had a, a battery chainsaw. But I thought to myself, I wonder if he left some wood because there was a snake. So I'm going out on my chainsaw, going yeah. I moved the bush like that, you know. You know, I mean, I mean, I hate creepy, crawly things. Amen. All right. The only person I know who likes those kind of things, one person so far, Brother Henry. But God, <laughs> let's go back and pick up the Bible. God, God makes lizards and insects and snakes and them small rodents and run around. It might be hard to see God's love. In the creation of little annoying animals like mice and rats and ants and squirrels and moles and scorpions. I had to come to Texas. I saw three scorpions since I've been here. I mean, scorpions. I mean, I'm thinking, you know, like some of these movies in the desert, you know, scorpions. You can hear these things, you know, so you die. I mean, these things are like crawling right there. There's a scorpion. Tarantulas. It's amazing. <clears throat> and other creepy crawly things. But listen, God originally pronounced these creatures what? Good. It was only after the fall that everything changed and these creepy things turned against us and turned against each other. Remember that God can even use these little pests for our benefits. The Bible says, and this is a tough one, the Bible says we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him. All things. When Corey Ten Boom was placed in a concentration camp in in, in, in Nazi Germany, I think she was in Auschwitz, but I'm not sure, um, maybe Regensburg. But as a young girl, her sister told her that they were thankful for the lice that were afflicting the, 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 the kids in this concentration camp. And the story goes that she would say, Corey, you need to thank God for the lice. Thank God for the lice. And she would say, I could not thank God for the lice. But what was interesting is the German guards would not come in their barracks because of the very lice. And so these people were able to have Bible studies and these people were able to, uh, to do things that other people were not because the German guards did not want the lice to get on them and, they, and prevented them. And so she had to eventually thank God for the lice. <laughs> Creepy crawly things. We're going to move on. I'm move. <laughs> Wildlife. God created living creatures on land like elephants and lions and bears and tigers and giraffes. And even, even the extinct dinosaurs. God created it all. <coughs> God describes one of these large animals in Job. Look at the behemoth. When I made along with you. Which I made along with you. God tells Job. He eats grass like an ox. Uh, look at the strength of his loins. Uh, and the power of his muscles and his belly. He stiffens his tail like a cedar tree. The, the tendons of his thighs are woven firmly together. Firmly together. The bones are bronze tubes. Uh, his limbs are like iron rods. He is the foremost of God's work. 
Only his maker can draw the sword against him. God was probably, uh, uh, Job was probably describing a dinosaur there, a dinosaur. Probably a dinosaur. This behemoth of a creature. You see, there is no creature alive today that fits the description except to say that back there, before the great worldwide flood, there were dinosaurs. And this was probably describing a dinosaur. Don't let anybody tell you, oh, you Christian Job don't believe in dinosaurs. What are we, stupid? Of course we believe in dinosaurs. We're not dumb. They were in the, they probably went into the ark. I mean, not the big ones, you know, but the babies. They probably went into the ark. But when they got out of uh, the ark and the, 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 the climate, the topography, everything had changed. The dinosaurs did not survive. So God creates these things for us, for you, for me. God's creation is incredible. Its beauty and artistry is unbelievable. It should bring awe and wonder to our minds, reminding of us, uh, us of an awesome and magnificent creator. Despite this overwhelming evidence, humanity still refuses to acknowledge God. Well, this is just all evolved by itself. What? Instead, many choose to believe in the myth of evolution where everything was created out of nothing on its own with no designer. Yet Genesis clearly teaches us that God designed everything for us, for you, and for me. Before, before we turn the next page to look at the apex of God's creation next week, I want to conclude today's message with a piece of scripture that talks about a time when the ruler of all mankind will rule upon the earth with all power and glory and praise. And he will cause everything to be just right and perfect. And even the animals and men will live in harmony together. And that's found in, in Isaiah chapter 11. Listen to what God's word says. Then a shoot will grow from the stump of Jesse and the branch from the roots will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him and the spirit of wisdom and understanding. Of course, talking about Jesus Christ, a spirit of counsel and strength, a spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight will be in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes. He will not execute justice by what he hears with his ears, but he will judge the poor righteously and execute justice upon the oppressed. Of the land, you know, no justice, no peace. No, no Jesus, no peace. If you want justice, we just need Jesus. Amen. Jesus will provide all the justice we need in this world. Amen. When it ain't fair. No, this world is not fair. Well, life's not fair. No, it's not. But Jesus is. Amen. He will strike the land with discipline from his mouth. And he will, he will kill the wicked with a command from his lips. Righteousness and faithfulness will be a belt around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf, the young lion, and the fatling will be together. And a child will lead them. Think about that. A child will lead them. The cow and the bear will graze. Their young ones will be lie down together. And the lion will eat straw like an ox. The infant will play. Be, be, oh boy, this is fun. Verse 8. Beside the cobra's pit. And a toddler will put his hand into a snake's den. Man, I was afraid just to go into the vicinity of that burn pile from what I know about snakes. No one will harm or destroy on my entire holy mountain for the land will be as full of the knowledge of the Lord as the sea is filled with water. And then he goes on in chapter 11. God's beauty. One day, we're going to understand why God created it all for us. And it will be brought back into perfection again. I want to close with a, a famous uh, video. And then we'll have our hymn of invitation. Watch this video.